the waterfront Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we're undertaking our efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Waterfront Toronto also acknowledges that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples today. I think over the last few weeks, and even more news uh, that came out this morning, um, is extremely uh, concerning to everyone uh, with respect to what's happened in the past and uh, with dealing with our uh, residential schools, and it's a legacy of the harm that uh, has happened to the Indigenous people and makes it more important that we remain committed to including Indigenous voices and histories in our revitalization efforts. In fact, to recognize National Indigenous History Month, we've undertaken a variety of initiatives which will be discussed further in the CEO's report. But I want to say as well, this past Monday, I had the privilege of representing Waterfront Toronto at the groundbreaking of the new Indigenous hub in the Canary District of the West Donlands. And the hub is the first of its kind in Canada. It will serve as a landmark for Indigenous peoples and the neighbourhood as a whole. It'll be providing health services, employment services, along with cultural and community resources. Um, as someone once said, it took about seven years, I think, to get to this point and hoping it will serve the next seven generations. So uh, it was a very successful event um, and something I think we should all be proud of and that Waterfront was a part of it. At this point, I would also uh, like to extend our best wishes and congratulations to Drew Fagan, Leslie Wu, and Ro Barwaj. Hopefully I have that pronouncing okay. As new appointees by the federal government, um, and we look forward to uh, your hard work. We look forward to giving you a more formal orientation rather than just throwing you into the uh, mill this morning um, at the last minute, but hope you'll uh, get a, an idea of all the important work we're doing. This is a full agenda today, and we appreciate your commitment and um, welcome your involvement. Um, I talked about the confidentiality. I should also say that we do have two seats left to be filled by the provincial government. I have been in touch uh, with representatives and they, the uh, process is underway and I expect uh, either by the end of July or end of August, those two uh, places should be filled uh, as well. Um, so, so that is um, uh, some of my uh, uh, preliminary um, remarks, but uh, maybe just before we go uh, further, I'd like to ask our um, our three um, members, uh, new members, maybe just to say a word. Drew, since you're at the top of my screen, can we start with you? Just give us a one minute resume. So, so thank you, Chair Stephen. Uh, pleasure to be here. Honor to be here. Um, Drew Fagan, I'm a professor at University of Toronto, the Monk School these days, and also a senior advisor at Macmillan Vantage, a consulting company. I sit on a couple other boards uh, of note, the McMichael Gallery, a provincial agency, as well as uh, the board of Massey Hall, Roy Thompson Hall, and uh, a lot of work being done to reopen Massey Hall. I was a deputy minister for many years, including with our CEO, George Zagarek. So I've watched Waterfront Toronto closely as a deputy from 2010 to 14 at the Ministry of Infrastructure. And then after that, in fact, when I had the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport from 2014, 2015, the Pan Am Games, was deputy minister for that and, and worked closely on the, uh, the build out of the West Onlands. So I've uh, been involved in waterfront from within government. Before I was a deputy minister at the province, I was uh, the head of policy planning at the in Ottawa at the Department of Foreign Affairs, so also worked in the federal public service. Um, I've thought for a long time that Waterfront is just an incredibly important agency for a couple of reasons. One, the tripartite governance is almost unprecedented. 
you know, a colleague of mine at U of T at the Monk School wrote his PhD thesis on Waterfront Toronto in terms of governance many, many years ago, and uh, and also the scope and scale of the build, and that's on the website, and everybody knows how big that is, and the progress, which has just been extraordinary over the last years. And you know, I'm also a neighbor. I can see one of the stacks from my third floor window, you know, and I followed the progress as a neighbor living in Riverdale, cycling, uh, walking the spit, uh, driving around. It's really extraordinary. So I'm tickled to be part of this. I look forward to working with everybody on the board and in fact, with management, knowing that the uh, the role of the board is nose in, fingers out. I learned that from Raul's organization. So pleasure to be here and look forward to working with all of you. All right, thanks, thanks, Drew. Raul? Great, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Chair. Uh, just like Drew, extremely excited to be here. An extraordinary opportunity to build on uh, some really good work that's uh, already been done. Uh, a little bit around the board, I remain on the board of the Institute of Corporate Directors. I chair the Global Network of Director Institutes, and I just stepped off of the Rideau Hall Foundation board after nine years. I'm currently the CEO of the Institute of Corporate Directors, and many of you will know that that's a national association of about 15,000 members, all committed to improving performance through good corporate governance. So hopefully I can bring some of those learnings uh, uh, to Waterfront as well. Uh, I spent nine years as the CEO of the Toronto Foundation, so city building is something that I get really excited about, so I'm really pleased about the opportunity to build off of that. And my connection with the waterfront is quite long as well, and I tell you it intertwines a little bit with uh, Leslie Wu's background. We go back to the Olympic bid, so my time as VP of the Olympic bid also uh, led me to do a lot of work along the waterfront, uh, but also I worked as a board member of the Toronto Port Authority, I was also vice chair of George Brown College as we built the waterfront campus. And I completed nine years on the board of Metrolinx as well. So this area is near and dear in my heart. Uh, but most importantly, and somewhat like Drew, I also live, work, and play on the waterfront as I live in the beaches. So I spend a lot of time sailing out there, and I'm always riding the spit. So I've uh, been a long believer in the enormous potential of the waterfront. So this is an extraordinary journey to be a part of, and I'm proud to serve. Great, thank you. And Leslie. Thank you so much. And, and like uh, my colleagues, I'm delighted to be uh, and join the board. Um, I am the newly minted, not so newly minted, it's 10 months now, CEO at Civic Action. And some of you may know me as um, in my role for the uh, roughly about 12 years as the Chief Planning and Development Officer at Metrolinx. Um, I serve on the Women's College Hospital Board. Uh, I've been very involved with Herbal Land Institute. I sit on the Cur Curtis Infrastructure Global Advisory Board for the Urban Land Institute, and just now stepping off the America's Executive for the Urban Land Inst Institute. The waterfront has been part of my life um, for quite a long time, and um, uh, I had been involved, Drew mentioned the tripartite agreement. I was the uh, um, advisor in the city's mayor's office. The city was the last signator to that tripartite agreement, and my job was to get council to sign that uh, way back when, seems a million years ago. So it's amazing to be sitting here uh, at this stage. It's so much progress has been made. But if you really knew me, <laughs> you would know that uh, I'm a descendant of the ancient peoples of uh, Southern China. My family are immigrants as indentured laborers to the small island of Trinidad, uh, the land of the Carib and the Arawaks, an island settled by the Spanish and the French and the British. Uh, I'm an immigrant uh, to Canada. I came as a student um, of architecture and then urban planning. And now I consider myself a student of cities. Um, I'm, I'm, I live here now on the treaty lands of the Toronto Purchase, and I am a believer of the dish with one spoon. And the, the fact that we can all share this land to the mutual <coughs> benefit of everyone. So in my new role at Civic Action, uh, we're building pathways for rising leaders to have a place at the table, tables like this one. And we're co-creating actions that can include equity deserving communities as part of the economy. So I'm honored to be on this board. I welcome to the chance to bring, bring the perspective that this should be a waterfront that puts people first. And I hope that my time at this table will contribute to having more peoples connected to our waterfront. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Great, and once again, uh, welcome. 
And I'd be remiss if I just didn't want to, if I didn't at this point, just express my appreciation to um, Laurie Scott, the former Minister of Infrastructure, uh, who paid a lot of attention and was very much at top of our issues and kept in contact with me along the way and welcome our new minister, Kinga Surma, uh, as we move forward with the uh, important work uh, that we're doing on the waterfront. So now that uh, we've heard from everybody, now we'll get down to uh, business and the next item of business is the approval of the of the agenda. Um, Jack Winberg, could you move that? Happy to do so. And uh, Kevin, I see you. Can I ask you to second? That's seconded, thanks, Steve. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Yeah. Um, are there any declarations of conflict of interest this morning? Okay, great. Um, uh, as we uh, just indicated before, I've, I've already given my opening remarks. And uh, for everyone else who's joined us once again, I, I thank our government partners for their time. And just to remind everybody that uh, this is being conducted um, uh, and being uh, recorded uh, and will be made, made available for public viewing. So um, as you can see, uh, we have a number of items uh, under the consent agenda. One thing that we added recently was um, the highlight of key messages, which we have there for people to review, uh, which serves as a good summary uh, of the items uh, under discussion. Uh, the next item is the approval of the minutes of the open session of March 25th, 2021. Uh, Joe, can you move that? And uh, Kevin, second? Great. I second. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, and uh, at this point, um, I'd like to turn the floor over to George uh, to give us the uh, CEO report. Thank you, Steve, and uh, hopefully you guys can see me now. And uh, let me also just welcome our uh, three new board members. I think you bring a great wealth of experience and look forward. To Actually, Leslie, we may need your help as we look at our uh, mandate extension. You may have to go back to council again, so we'll uh, talk about that later. Um, in uh, the CL report, I'm going to just go through quickly. You'll get a chance to read through it. Um, but as Steve acknowledged, this is a National Indigenous Month, and uh, we have really built over the last few years uh, a great relationship with our Indigenous partners, and uh, it is not just a moment in time. It is an investment in long-term relationship, and uh, they've been working with us. Um, we've partnered with them around some archaeological uh, digs uh, as we go through the flood protection project. Um, we have uh, partnered with them on design, on some of the artwork. Uh, we continue to work with them uh, around even looking at uh, the development of Parliament Slip. Uh, and in our parks uh, area. We, this month, have also focused on sharing some of their stories, uh, both with regards to one of our Indigenous artists, but also uh, Matthew Hickey, who we added uh, to our uh, design review panel. And uh, Matthew has also contributed a fantastic blog, which I would recommend uh, both blogs be read by the board members as well. And. Uh, and we continue to uh, work with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, we are working with them on a potential future project, uh, an Indigenous centre on the water. Uh, so that is something that uh, we continue to assist them with. Um, uh, let me go to the RFQ real briefly. Um, just we'll talk about this in more detail later, but uh, and the RFP, we, we received 10 uh, proposals, which is, uh, I think, quite uh, reflective of how important this is to the city and how much interest there is in this project. So uh, we're currently in the evaluation uh, period and there was a first presentation to the steering committee um, that will come back to the board with a short list in July. And uh, Parliament Slip, we have um, completed the business plan, submitted that both to the federal and provincial governments and hopefully we might hear something soon from uh, those two governments with regards to the request um, on the funding uh, for that project. Um, Wendy will probably uh, reference uh, a little bit of the summary of our last human resource uh, and governance committee and we talked a lot about the diversity and inclusion initiatives that 
we have undertaken. There's a whole list um, that Rose could walk you through. Uh, this is a really important aspect for our future in terms of both uh, internally with regards to the composition of our executive team and the rest of our staff. We actually have broadly uh, a pretty diverse group as an organization, but we do have to work on our succession planning for the senior management group. Um, but we also need to make sure we're engaging with uh, a diverse group. We have our stakeholder advisory committee, um, which is a lot of, quite frankly, the neighborhood areas. And uh, what we need, do need to do is make sure that we look at and have been looking at engaging with other um, uh, demographic groups. Um, let me just uh, maybe to end with two more things. The Portland's flood protection project, Kevin uh, and Farm got updated. Um, the great news on this is despite the fact that our material costs uh, have gone like other uh, projects uh, across Ontario, skyrocketed in terms of price, uh, we are still uh, looking to come in on time and on budget. Uh, and I give all the credit to our team and to Ellis Don, who've done a great job in managing through the pandemic and managing these pressures. Um, we continue to see some pressures around utilities, but uh, we also have um, seen some positive solutions on that and continue to have discussions there. Uh, the last thing was I did mention, uh, partly in humor, there is a strategic review um, underway by the three levels of government on our mandate. Uh, we are currently, our mandate goes to 2028. Um, KPMG was hired to do a quick review uh, for the three levels of government to look at the last five years. Um, that uh, draft has been shared with board members and we'd be happy to share it with the new board members as well. Uh, basically what they said was uh, KPMG had a very positive review saying Waterfront Toronto is a nationally significant project um, the mandate was aligned with three levels of government and was fulfilling a lot of the priorities of those governments. That the uh, tri-government model is an effective vehicle, that we've uh, demonstrated efficiency and effectiveness in terms of managing our, our funding. Um, but there are three key issues that still have to be addressed. One is the mandate extension beyond 2028. Uh, as we continue to contract with people, they do want to know that Waterfront Toronto is still going to be um, uh, the official agency that they're contracting with as we get into contracts that go beyond 2028. Um, we are working very closely with uh, Create TO and the City of Toronto and working uh, to resolve any issues of role uh, clarification roles and responsibilities. I have to say both Steve Trumpeter, Chris Murray, and, and myself, we're very happy with the great work that we're doing collectively. And I think 80% um, of the issues have been resolved and the last 20% we're working through. And the last part is the long-term funding. We are on a project by project funding basis, which is not sustainable in the long-term. We do need more flexibility in borrowing, um, which the governments have before them and uh, KPMG has highlighted that that issue has to be addressed as well. Um, on the dashboard, you'll see it's all yellow and green, so uh, I think we're doing well. Uh, and Steve, in uh, the interest of being brief uh, to give us time to resolve uh, and speak to the other issues, I think I'll end it there. Great, uh, great report. Does anyone uh, have any questions of uh, George? Okay, so we will, uh, we will move on. Um, as you can see as well, um, there are uh, reports that we've taken as read uh, from from our farm, uh, from Human Resources, and from IREC. But just before we move forward, uh, Kevin, is there anything you would like to add in the open session regarding the uh, farm report? Uh, no, it was, other than it was a, a productive meeting, uh, we had a session with our auditors, both uh, third party and our external ones, and um, management and the finance side is doing extremely well um, working remotely and otherwise and uh, there's a number of items that we are recommending for approval that will come up later in the meeting uh, we we endorsed all of the, all of the items um, including the capital approval for key side of 14 million which we'll we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on so all in all a good session um, I welcome the new members personally. Look forward to having one of you on our understaffed farm committee. And uh, um, but uh, a very uh, 
productive meeting and, and no real issues to report. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, Wendy? Oh, thank you, Steve. So just very briefly, um, on June 10th, the committee met to address some key items and also uh, Steve Diamond, our chair, joined the meeting and the agenda included the following items, the governance review update, board evaluation, stakeholder relations plan, and a very comprehensive human resources update. And as George mentioned, we're, we're focused on the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and, and these are of critical importance. Um, also a staffing performance review for 2021, and then the year-end performance assessment for executives and the CEO. So I'd like to just highlight that the board evaluation process on today's agenda, which is item number nine, comes with the recommendation of the committee and also that the compensation arrangements for item number six and seven will be discussed in closed session. And other than that, I think we can take the report as read, Steve. Okay, thanks very much, Wendy. And uh, Jack, anything uh, before uh, you'd like to add? Uh, really, no, the report is, is self-explanatory. And I think that uh, you know we're all very excited about the response to the um, to the RF, RFP and to the, RF, the RFQ in terms of uh, getting Keyside, Keyside uh, developed. And um, we look forward to further discussion in the closed session. Okay, great. So we'll go over that uh, in, uh, in more detail, uh, a lot to be discussed and closed. And um, there is for information, um, the One Front Toronto Insurance Program that's included. Uh, this was briefly discussed at our last meeting. Um, and it's just there for uh, people's information. Uh, what I would suggest is if anyone uh, has any issues or questions that we have a packed agenda, but we could certainly raise it at the next meeting um, if anyone uh, wants to, and I'll just make a note. And uh, Ian, maybe just make a note if we want to uh, raise that at the next meeting um, rather than going through it today. Thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, we're now um, moving on to waterfront priority priority projects. Um, David uh, Kirsten, our chief project officer, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the new board members. Uh, we have some, uh, as we're doing every uh, quarter, some photo uh, updates on progress on the projects that are happening across the waterfront. Um, so if we can get started, Charmaine. So we have updates on work happening in East Bayfront, as you can see, and of course, uh, lots of photos on work happening across the port lanes on the 23 Portland's flood protection projects. Next. Um, so first we have T3 Bayside. You can see that the uh, Heinz project is coming out of the ground. This is uh, the uh, commercial um, uh, building in uh, phase two of uh, uh, Bayside. Uh, so that's coming along, and this is a 10-story uh, uh, all-wood building um, that uh, Heinz uh, is uh, constructing. Next. Uh, we have a video. Uh, I noticed some beautiful tiebacks there. <laughs> Only the best, Steve. Okay. Um, we have a uh, drone video uh, supplied to us by uh, Mankeys and hopefully it plays. So this is the Waterfront Innovation Center. Uh, Mankeys was a successful bidder. Um, this is a commercial property uh, in um, uh, East Bayfront in the Dockside Precinct uh, right adjacent to Sugar Beach. So you can see that uh, it's block one and two. This is block one of Dockside, uh, sort of a triangular shaped uh, piece of property. Uh, at the north end of Sugar Beach. Um, the two properties, Block 1 and 2, are connected by a uh, bridge over um, over Richardson um, that comes into, uh, or into Dockside rather, that comes into the, uh, into the subdivision. The uh, primary tenants um, for this project are uh, WPP and MARS. Uh, there are a number of other high-tech tenants as well. Uh, the building is slated to now open in the fall um, with the uh, tenants beginning to move in at that point in time. So I'd just like to thank uh, Mankeys for providing some visuals for our use today. Yeah, was that, is it fully leased? Um, I'm actually going to ask uh, Christina or Leslie to respond to that. I'm not sure. 
and I know that. Sorry, I didn't. Um, was that so? I didn't hear the last word in the question. Was that blank? I, I just wondering whether they, the building is fully leased. Um, almost, almost, okay. very yeah. close. Yeah, okay, that's great. That's great. Okay. Um, Okay, so some of the interior shots, you can see a shot of the uh, bridge, um, the uh, interiors for the tenants. Next. Um, Aquabella um, from Tridel. So this is the uh, third residential property um, on the waterfront uh, for Tridel, um, now uh, nearing completion and occupancy. And then in the Portland's flood protection, this is our, uh, we do a uh, st stitched together drone overhead. It looks like a satellite um, on a regular basis. This is the current um, uh, satellite view. You can see in the Central River Valley, um, the uh, shape of the river. Um, we've actually started uh, river finishes in that area. Um, I want to steal my own thunder and wait till the uh, photos start to appear. So let's... Uh, we move along. So here's the uh, Central River Valley. You can see that uh, we are placing stone, which will be the bottom of the river um, in the center area. Uh, we are also placing levee core material, and that is clay uh, that is intended to separate the river itself from the wetlands that are being constructed uh, in the valley. Um, and uh, Oh, went a little too far. And in the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll actually start um, river finishes. Uh, uh, we've got uh, crib walls and uh, and other structures that uh, are being constructed within the river for structural purposes, and uh, we'll start to see those taking shape. Next. Um, in terms of uh, excavation, Central River Valley, the Don Greenway, and the ice management area are complete. Excavation and an area we're calling the elbow, which is where those um, three areas meet. Uh, excavation is now started. Can't be completed until the second leg of the Commissioner Street Bridge is installed, um, but we'll get uh, most of it. We'll get it all completed by uh, the end of this year. Next. Um, in the, uh, I mentioned in the River Valley, the stone you can see on the left, on the right side of the photo is the bottom of the river. Um, to the left are um, the uh, uh, cutoff walls and uh, wetland areas um, in this area. Next, uh, the Don Greenway excavation is complete. The risk management measures have been placed and we're now doing the um, protective layer following which uh, finishes, uh, material finishes will begin. So we'll start putting down um, horticultural soils uh, before we begin planting. Next, uh, in the ice management area, I mentioned that the uh, um, Excavation is complete. The ice management area is actually that. It's um, it's not going to have uh, soft finishes. It will be all armor stone, um, and it's intended to break up any ice that uh, may come down before it gets into the uh, uh, river valley itself. We'll see that finishes start next year. Um, and here we have the final excavation area of the elbow. Um, work is uh, has started and will be pretty far progressed by the end of this year or complete by the end of this year. In uh, Poles and Slip, we've removed the uh, dock wall uh, at the end, at the head of the slip where we will connect to the river and we've started wet excavation. Um, in fact, we've almost completed the wet excavation uh, to the cutoff wall, um, which will form the, um, um, what we're calling the west plug. So that will, uh, structure will remain in place until about the third quarter of 2023 when we open the river up to the inner harbor. Next, we've started um, uh, wet utilities in both Commissioner Street and um, Cherry Street. So we're doing a number of different uh, operations there. We're doing uh, open cut uh, uh, sewer installations on the right on Cherry Street. And on the left, we're doing uh, directional drilling, hydraulic directional drilling. And that's a water main, um, which will be, uh, it's going under the river. The river doesn't exist today, but uh, it, um, uh, we're installing this uh, pipe uh, through a drilling process underneath uh, what will be the future river alignment. Um, at the uh, uh, west end of the site, we have the um, Cherry Street South Bridge, which will arrive in October. So foundations and abutments are complete now um, for that uh, structure. And uh, the platform on the left has been constructed. It is a temporary structure that's actually intended simply to allow us to get the um, bridge off the barge and hoisted into place on its foundations once it arrives. Next. 
um, the Commissioner Street Bridge. So this is the western half of the vehicular and pedestrian bridge, cycling bridge. Um, it is in place on its foundations. Once the eastern half uh, arrives, the two halves will be joined, welded together, um, and uh, then work begun on um, the finishes, uh, the deck, the decking, the asphalt, um, railings, etc. Um, in advance of opening Commissioner Street uh, next summer. Next. And that is all for me on that particular element and item. Wow. Well, there's a lot there and uh, David, uh, amazing uh, work that you're doing. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions of uh, David? OK, well, thanks. Uh, by the way, did you say the water main is going below the riverbed? It is. It is. So we are drilling uh, a number of water mains, one on Cherry Street, one on uh, Commissioner Street, and they're dr being drilled uh, under the uh, future river. Um, actually, one's going under the Keating Channel, the other's going under the river. So if something ever happens, how do they repair it? Um, they go in through the pipe itself. Oh, I and see. And they repair okay. it from the inside. Right, got it. Okay. Um, Steve, David, if I just, uh, sorry, it's George. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out to the board members and in particular to the new board members, as soon as uh, we can access the site, uh, we will organize a tour uh, for the board members. So you'll get a chance to see the site. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Wear, wear your comfy shoes. It's a long walk. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, uh, David, I'm going to turn the. Um, I think this uh, is also on the flood uh, protection cost estimate, the risk analysis um, that's, and, and the timing. That's right, Steve. So um, we have uh, completed our first quarter uh, estimate update, risk assessment, and risk quantification. And we will actually be doing this twice a year um, from here till the end of the project. Uh, as you know, at the end of last year, we completed the 90% stage gate. Um, this is a similar exercise um, that we will be doing every six months. Um, the uh, results, as George has mentioned, is uh, that we continue to forecast completion uh, on or under budget. Um, and the uh, project is being for is forecast to be completed on time. And I'll get into some of the details of that as we go through very quickly the presentation. Um, so this is uh, um, this is our, our latest update has been reviewed um, and uh, in detail with BTY, our uh, independent um, capital project monitor uh, who report uh, to the farm committee. Um, and at this point in time, we are um, projecting a 63% uh, probability of completion uh, on time, which is uh, uh, slightly less than at 90% uh, where we're at 70%, but I'll talk some detail. I'll give you a bit of detail on that shortly. So um, can we move on? Charmaine, probably a few slides. Okay, keep going. Um, so I mentioned that this is a uh, uh, part of our uh, risk um, mitigation and management process uh, to undertake um, um, updated estimates, uh, cost estimates uh, on a regular basis every six months, um, update our risk assessment and update the um, risk quantification. Uh, next slide. Uh, I won't um, get into the status, we can take this as red, um, but uh, work is continuing um, um, uh, uh, construction across the site um, on all um, factors or on all elements and uh, um, design work is uh, uh, for parks and, and river finishes is uh, being completed over the next uh, month or two. Next. So where do we stand? Um, we are, if you refer to the fourth line in the um, uh, table on this page, um, we are tracking uh, costs and contingency on a real-time basis every month. Um, so at the, as you recall, at the end of, or you may recall, at the end of the 90% stage gate, um, we were forecasting, continue to forecast 1.185 billion, uh, but had 48.9 million in available contingency at that time based on estimates um, uh, undertaken. Uh, as part of the night versus stage gate. Um, today on a um, uh, real-time updated basis, we have um, 
uh, utilized approximately, well, almost exactly three million of that contingency on uh, items uh, and costs that were not reflected in the 90% stage gate. Um, so that's where we stand today, and we'll continue to update that uh, on a monthly basis and track that on a monthly basis uh, through the end of the project. Um, with respect to our um, current forecast from the uh, contractor, the um, while the overall budget remains unchanged, you can see that the estimated <coughs> cost from the contractor is uh, increased by uh, approximately 15 million uh, or 14 million dollars from 916 million to 929 million uh, and as a result there's a um, commensurate a reduction in contingency the um, primary uh, ratio or the primary reasons for that increase uh, relate to soil uh, treatment, soil management, and soil disposal costs. So over the winter, we undertook a very detailed assessment of um, the efficacy of our soil treatment uh, plant from and, and uh, productivity from last year. Um, and based on that assessment, the contractor and our consultants have um, re-estimated the cost of managing the soil. Um, that cost has increased, uh, and that is the predominant uh, increase that's uh, reflected in the first column under escalated hard costs. Um, next, uh, so I mentioned uh, about $15 million variance uh, in hard costs, majority of the Earthworks Marine and Parks, and that's where the soil um, uh, factors lie. Uh, the other change uh, is um, we have adjusted how utility cost sharing uh, is being reflected um, as we have re reached uh, agreement with uh, Toronto Hydro and uh, Enbridge, at least on the portion of work that is um, called or what we call the enhancement work. So we're responsible or uh, we are undertaking to pay for um, the replacement of any uh, hydro infrastructure or gas infrastructure that was existing. Um, but anything that is uh, new and uh, beyond what was existing, the utilities will pay for. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, just more detail on that um, utility issue. I won't get into that detail. Next slide. Uh, here is how the 14 million breaks down. Again, I won't get into that level of detail. Uh, and with respect to soft costs, minor change in soft costs, but uh, forecasting a total of 203 million at this point in time. Next. Uh, I mentioned contingency drawdown and how we're managing that. Um, fair amount of information here, which I won't uh, um, belabor. If we go to the next slide. Um, uh, this reflects uh, where we were at at the bottom at the uh, 90% stage gate. Let's go to the next slide, please. And then reflecting where we're at today, uh, 45.9 million. Um, and you can see that uh, between the 90% stage gate and the um, uh, to the end of March, uh, a number of um, uh, positives and negatives with respect to the uh, contingency um, uh, to uh, result in the number that we have today. Next. Um, with respect to the risk register, there have been, um, we have also updated the risk register, uh, and essentially the risk register, uh, the value of risks has increased <clears throat> by about $20 million, and that is reflective of two um, main um, uh, changes to the risk register. One is, uh, as mentioned by George, uh, we have uh, experienced in the market a substantial um, cost escalations on commodities, so lumber at you know over 100 to up to 200 uh, percent increases. Uh, steel increase has been substantial, and and you know in, in the order or you know, beyond 30 and 50 percent, uh, depending on the type of steel. Um, and that's partly due to COVID, but also due to you know uh, other factors like uh, tariffs and dumping and um, some. Um, commodity uh, issues between some of the big commodity players. Uh, nevertheless, um, as a result of that, we have added a $25 million contingency to address the market uh, changes. That contingency um, is based on or is uh, reflective of the fact that we've got about 300 plus million dollars worth of um, work yet to procure. Uh, and uh, while we had accounted for escalations, we had not accounted for escalations at this magnitude. Uh, and then the other uh, factor is um, that we've addressed in the risk assessment is um, uh, additional, once again, additional soil. While we have uh, 
um, built uh, about 20 million in or 15 million into uh, the estimate for soil disposal costs. We've built a similar amount into the risk assessment uh, and the contingency to address um, the potential uh, for um, additional soil treatment and soil disposal costs. So those are the two big changes on the risk register. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, S curve um, reflects the um, probability now of completion. Um, you can see in the second bullet, uh, probability has decreased from 70% to 63% um, in, um, uh, since the 90% stage gate. You can go to the next slide, Charmaine. Um, what that means, practically speaking, is um, that uh, in, in order to um, achieve a 75% probability of um, achieving budget, um, we would need to increase the contingency by 5.9 million. Now we can do that in a number of ways. Um, we can do that by um, um, having uh, reasonable tender results and potentially saving money on tenders. And we have saved money on some tenders and other tenders uh, have come in over budget. Um, so that's one area. And then the other area is uh, by introducing uh, cost optimizations, uh, project optimizations, and we continue to do that. Uh, we've identified a number of optimizations in this exercise um, that are summarized at the end of the slide deck, um, and we will continue to do that um, as long as we can. Obviously, the further we get into uh, construction um, and um, completion of design with uh, approvals by the authorities, um, those optimizations become more difficult to implement and identify. David, are those um, that 5.9 million? Is that above the original contingency, or is that? that no, yes, that would be additional contingency above the original contingency. So that's just that that is a calculation that the uh, uh, risk uh, risk consultants uh, do. So they 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 do a reversionary calculation that says, okay, to achieve 75%, um, what is the value of the project going to be? And in this case, it'd be 1.185. Well, actually, one point. Um, I have to add six million dollars to that number. One point one five. So one one. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> one point yeah. one yeah. nine one million. That's what it would be. Um, so there's a seventy five percent probability that we will complete at one point one nine million as opposed to one point one eight five million um, billion. Sorry. Well, so that's, how much are you, that's but your, you haven't used that much of the contingency to date, have you? We have not. We still have four. So this is just forecasting. So we've only you only used. We still have um, uh, you know 46 million in contingency available, um, and we are you know trying to be uh, tight fisted uh, with it, obviously, um, and retain as much as we can. There are certainly a number of things where we have um, um, value engineered the project. Where if we had money at the end of the project, some of those things that we valued engineered, um, we would like to actually be able to add back to the project. Uh, and there are some things where we can do that. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to retain as much contingency as we can. Um, but what this reflects is that the, um, you know, we're we're very close. You know, on a 1.185 billion dollar project, we're sort of six million dollars away from uh, having a 75 percent probability of completing on time. So reasonably, you know, not not as comfortable as we'd like, but um, um, not in terrible shape. By any stretch. No, and and at a time when commodity prices have gone through the roof, it's it's um it's pretty actually remarkable. Um, David, one other question: When when would the last tenders go out in the timing of this, or when we would know um, the project's been fully tendered? That will happen over the next five to six months, actually. Um, so that's really going to give us a good idea. Yeah, we'll know we'll know pretty well by then. Okay. Uh, obviously, we still find things on site. It's a it's a very big site, and you know every you know site conditions happen on every project. But um, but the you know, right now we think the biggest monetary risk is the uh, is the market risk. Right. Okay. Um, next slide. I'm not sure that there's. Uh, oh, from a <clears throat> from a schedule perspective, schedule has uh, uh, gotten much better for a number of reasons. Uh, predominantly, that we have rebaselined, and I, we mentioned this previously, rebaselined the schedule um, uh, to better be able to manage um, the schedule moving forward. Um, as a result of that rebaselining, the 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 risk and the variables uh, in the schedule have changed dramatically, and um, we are now um, forecasting you know a potential delay of. Uh, uh, 3.1 months um, based on a completion date of 
uh, the end of December 2023. So even if we were to um, have that delay materialize, um, we're still looking at a March 2024 completion date, which is what the uh, contribution agreements um, with the governments require from us. So um, fairly positive results here. Yeah. Great. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, I mentioned top risks, the external market forces of the commodity pricing. The next three are um, the uh, soil treatment, soil disposal uh, potential costs. And then we have some opportunities as well um, that we may be able to uh, take advantage of. Um, and then with respect to schedule, you can see the schedule impacts are you know, substantially less than our previous uh, risk assessment. We've now retired a number of risks and, and reassessed the number of risks and uh, those scheduled delays have uh, substantially been mitigated. Um, next steps, we'll continue to uh, manage the risk issues and contingency. Uh, we will um, undertake to update this again uh, uh, for the end of the year. So uh, at the end of uh, um, the second quarter in, in October, we'll do this again and uh, and come back to the Farm Committee and the Board with updated uh, information at that time. And I would just note one other thing with respect to commodities um, uh, pricing. The, uh, the latest information, in fact, in the last week, um, information has uh, come out that the um, price of lumber is actually off 40% from what it was at the peak in May. So we're we're already starting to see some corrections in, in commodities. Don't know how quickly that will uh, write itself and which commodities it may or may not affect, but um, that's, a, you know, that's a bit of positive news for us, although we uh, aren't going to adjust our risk uh, profiles at the moment uh, to see you know, how that uh, continues. And well, I won't go through the appendices. So any questions? Anybody have any questions of David? Great report and great work, David. Thank you. OK, um, moving on to the next item is the um, board evaluation. Um, we've uh, uh, Ian's going to give us a brief presentation. Uh, we're going to do a board evaluation in the fall. Um, and uh, this has been reviewed by the HRGSER committee. Um, and it's been recommended to the board for approval. Uh, Ian, do you want to uh, take over at this point and give us a little introduction? Sure. Thanks very much, Steve. And uh, you've already covered about two out of the three points I wanted to cover, so that's great. Um, this is a matter for approval. Uh, as you'll see from the screen, it's in, on page 78 of your board book. Uh, there's a form of resolution that we're requesting of the board. Uh, it has been, as Steve noted and as Wendy noted, it comes with a recommendation of the uh, Human Resources Governance and Stakeholder Relations Committee. Um, this comes out of a report, that, the governance report that we uh, received a review a couple years ago, uh, although identified as a uh, low risk, um, but commented that we should be conducting uh, board assessments. Uh, it reflects best practices. Uh, members can gain tangible and intangible value from a self-evaluation, reveals how the board is performing, and ensures appropriate roles and levels of engagement. Um, we, we did uh, legal and finance, along with other senior management, uh, reviewed several possible options. One was using our existing board uh, effect portal. Another was using external counsel. And the third was actually using MNP um, itself. Um, and uh, we reviewed all the proposals, all the ideas, and uh, recommended that uh, we use MNP um, based yeah, on their experience just, working uh, with the... Uh, just share yep. with the new board members who MNP is, please. Yeah, sure. Um, MNP is the is uh, our our internal auditors, uh, and they report up through through Farm in that respect. Um, uh, we uh, so uh, they and they conduct uh, reviews and audits from time to time. And in this case, it was a, a governance review, and uh, I'm not. Uh, and there's other reviews ongoing that that have been noted elsewhere. Um, and so their we've thought it best to use them because of their experience working with us 
and also because uh, they are uh, able to conduct or they would plan to conduct uh, interviews with existing board members and uh, past board members to uh, form a sort of a baseline. And then th we're doing that for this suggestions for this year. And then beyond that, uh, we'll look at what the alternatives are and perhaps put it out for an RFP if uh, if, if that's the uh, if that's the preferred uh, course of action. Um, the materials are in the board book. Uh, they're on this been up on the screen. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, but, uh, and as I say, the former resolution is in the book. Uh, great. You need a motion um, to for approval. Yes, the the former resolution. Um, it's on page seventy eight of the board book. Charmaine, if you can just. Uh, uh, go to that, but it, I can just read it. Be it resolved that the board approves that MMP LLP be engaged to conduct a board evaluation commencing in the fall of 2021. I'll make that motion, Steve. Thanks, Kevin. And I'll second it, Steve. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, uh, 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 any discussion? <clears throat> I just I just wanted to point out, John, um, Steve, that I, I, I don't know if Ian covered this, that you know, we were waiting until we had the full complement of the board, so we were looking at this for the fall. Okay, no, perfect. Okay, um, all in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda is the year-end audited uh, financial statements uh, from March 31st, 2021. Uh, Lisa, is that you? It is, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And and welcome also to our three new board members. It's a pleasure to have you at this meeting and on our board. Um, I'm going to provide a few brief highlights on our audited financial statements, um, and they are being presented today for board approval. Waterfront Toronto follows the Canadian public sector accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations, and there have been no changes to our accounting policies this year. Um, in terms of some very brief highlights, and on our financial statements, the corporation has finished the year in a strong cash position with over 100 million in cash reserves. We saw the largest dollar value investment in projects than any other year in history with an investment of 286 million, a large proportion of which around 85% relates to the Portman's flood protection project, which David's talked about this morning. And the majority of these investments in terms of how they're reflected in, in our financial statements are capitalized as assets under development in the statement of financial position, which is consistent with our accounting policies. Um, you should also note that our, our corporate operating costs, which are really our, our staff, our office, our IT and our corporate communications, they represent about just under 7% of that capital investment at about 18 million for the year. And our revenues this year totaled almost 250 million, 92% of which came from governments, largely for the Portland's Flood Protection Project again, and then about 8% 8, 8 from other sources, which included some land sale revenues, some interest income, and some other. BDO Canada are our external auditors, and they have completed their external audit, and they intend to issue an unqualified clean audit opinion and VDO reviewed the results of, of their audit with our Finance Audit Risk Management Committee on May 27th and did note and noted no matters of concern uh, related to the financial statements or the inter, or internal controls of, of Waterfront Toronto. And the Farm Committee has reviewed these financial statements and uh, is recommending approval of them by the board. In terms of, of next steps upon board approval, BDO will then issue their audit report. The financial statements will then be shared with governments and posted to our website by June 30th in compliance with our, our legislative mandate. So I'll just ask Kevin if he would like to make any comments related to the statements and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yep, no, we're recommending them. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the finance team is to be applauded. Um, no areas of concern whatsoever, even in our in-camera sessions with the uh, BDO. So um, a very as clean an audit as I've seen. So congratulations to the team and, and uh, Farm Committee is recommending the board approve the financial statements. Great, thanks for that, Kevin and Lisa. Um, if there are no questions, I'd like to um, ask somebody to move the motion. 
to approve the audited financial statements for the year March 31st. Jack? Happy to do so. Uh, Joe, are you around? Okay, great. All in favor? Carried. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, we're now on to the 2020-2021 um, uh, integrated annual report. Um, and um, again, is that Lisa, yours? Uh, your, your... It is, it is. Thanks, Steve. And I would like to acknowledge that while I am the one reporting on this item today, this year's integrated annual report, like last year's, was a true collaborative effort. I'd especially like to acknowledge the efforts of Cameron Mackay, our VP of Communications and Public Engagement, who with his team played a key role in pulling this document together, as well as Meg's uh, sustainability innovation team led by Aaron Bader, together with the finance team and a number of others. So our, our integrated annual report is our formal report back on our, our corporate plan for the year ending March uh, 2021. And that corporate plan was part of the rolling five-year strategic plan approved by the board back in December 2019. Charmaine, if you could just move to the next page. As you'll note on this beautiful cover, the theme of this year's report is connecting the waterfront. And this theme was really chosen because it emphasizes how our revitalization approach builds many forms of connections that characterize thriving cities, including physical, social, economic, as well as intangible connections. And while I'll take the report as read, because it is quite lengthy, and I'm happy to take questions as um, Cameron and, and, and George would as well, I did want to highlight three things about this year's report to the board. The first is that it is Waterfront Toronto's second integrated report with enhancements. So last year was the first time we combined our environmental, social, financial results into one integrated report. And this was based on leading reporting practices globally. And so this year, building on that reporting for impact approach, we've made a conscious effort to build in stronger linkages to ESG reporting based on feedback from the Farm Committee and others, as well as the Global Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Reporting Index, or GRI, which is the leading sustainability framework, as well as our own mandate-linked KPIs. And we've tried to keep all of those four frameworks um, together simply with using some, some graphic iconology throughout the document. So that's the first highlight. The second highlight I wanted to make was that we've really profiled our commitments and our actions towards creating an equitable and inclusive workplace and waterfront in our report. And you'll see this in the section titled Everybody's Waterfront on pages 24 to 25. And similar to that, we've, we also highlight the work we've been doing with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, which George also referred to in his opening remarks, and that, that's on pages 30 to 31. And then the third highlight I'd like to make is that 2020-2021 has been a very a year of strong performance for the corporation. From a financial perspective, we achieved 73% of our capital investment plan, which is the strongest performance out of the at least the last three years. And we also came in under budget by 12% in our corporate operating budget, largely dri driven by lower HR costs. And in terms of overall performance, we met or exceeded 83% of our mandate-driven KPI targets this year. And then you'll see all through the document examples of many important project milestones and achievements, such as the arrival of the Cherry Street Bridge to the Portlands, lots of beautiful photos of that, and the completion of the award-winning Cherry Street Stormwater Management Facility. And the board should also know that the Farm Committee has reviewed this report and provided some valuable feedback. And this feedback resulted in the map that you'll see on pages 14 to 15 which provides helpful context about where we work on the waterfront, as well as some of our current and past projects. Governments have also provided their feedback on the document and sections were also provided to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for their comment. So in terms of where this document goes from here, assuming that the board approves the integrated annual report today in principle, there will be an opportunity to make some further non-material edits up to the end of next week and perhaps a little beyond. 
And then in terms of um, some housekeeping items, for sure, we'll be updating the, the board committee and committee's page to include our, our three newly minted directors who have joined this week. Um, and then the plan is, is really to finalize the report in, in July. And I would invite Cameron if you're if you're there to provide some comments about the communications rollout. Certainly, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, the um, the report will be, uh, assuming it's passed, the report will be finalized by the um, 23rd of July, and there will be a print run of 250 copies, and directors will be sent um, print copies as well as a distribution to about 130 um, stakeholders, uh, so there will be a print copy, as well as there will be a four-week social campaign. As Lisa said, the, the report, and we we do this both for this report and for our rolling strategic plan, is highly visual, so we are able to uh, promote highly um, social, uh, highly shareable content online. So we'll have a four-week uh, campaign throughout August promoting the um, the report and drawing people to our uh, to our other content on our on our website. So that'll happen through throughout August. So you directors could expect uh, ten copies to be sent uh, in early August um, for distribution. We'd appreciate it if you if you could distribute it to your networks. Um, uh as as well because it it uh, it tends to uh, grab people's uh, attention and it's a very important document for us and kind of a gateway to other content steve if i may just add um you know a few of the board members in reviewing the material uh pointed out it really is a great story tell as to what waterfront toronto does um, and it was strongly suggested that board members get physical copies to share, uh, especially as we continue to look at philanthropy in the future. I think this is a great way to educate people on what the Waterfront uh, Toronto actually does. And what about, um, does this go to the media as well? We will send out um, copies to select uh, journalists who have covered us. With cover notes and directing them to areas that are interesting so uh to them so from an architecture perspective we'll point that out so we won't be issuing a media uh release per se but we'll be doing a targeted mail to the journalists right perfect great well it's a amazing uh report and it's been a, a good year so thank you i think we do need a motion to uh, approve the integrated annual report i'm happy to move it steve it's jack okay i'll so second it Great, thanks, Wendy. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, uh, Lisa and Cameron. Uh, a lot of hard work and it looks great. Okay, we're now on to um, the capital approval uh, for certain elements uh, designed at Keyside in terms of the infrastructure. So, uh, Julius, I think this is now your, uh, your uh, up to bat. Thank you, Steve, and good morning and welcome to the new board members. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, approval for uh, design services related to the Keyside project focused on public realm and infrastructure where we will be uh, pushing design forward to a 60% level and we will be looking to reprice uh, the program at that point, validate numbers and then uh, move forward to implementation. So today we're asking for approval for that 60% design amount, plus the approval for the engagement of a construction manager who will work uh, hand in hand with the consultant team. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is self-explanatory, I think. Next. Uh, so it's $4.2 million that we're looking for. We require approval over $5 million, so that's the purpose today. As I've touched on, we're looking for this uh, uh, funding uh, to validate design requirements and costs for the Keyside Public Realm and Infrastructure work. Um, this is an overview of the site. Uh, I think we all know what the program is meant to be, but for the new board members, uh, this is the large development that we are looking at that uh, we've received proposals on uh, to get these to market and to maximize land values. We need to put in place enabling infrastructure, realign some roads, deal with some environmental issues and coordinate with uh, Queens Key uh, redesign and development as well. Next. This is the overall site impacted by the work that's uh, covered by this request. 
within the red boundaries. I make a note that this does not include the Parliament slip fill work that is dealt with separately, uh, but does cover off all the realignment work of Parliament Street, as I've noted, the secondary streets and public realm shown. Next. We've broken this into elements following a similar pattern uh, as we have with the Portland's flood protection project. Uh, what is interesting in this one is that there are two separate design programs underway, uh, one for Queens Key, the second for the remaining work. So this covers the integration of those two design programs and will be validated at 60% design for both. This is the overall budget uh, for both infrastructure and design. So we have looked at what the cost would be out of these elements to get the design work to 60%. These are some images of the type of work we need to deal with, uh, dock wall modifications as we've done elsewhere uh, across the waterfront, uh, some indication of public realm silo park, which will be subject to a, an international design competition is part of this, this work. Next. Uh, we do go into the uh, details of uh, servicing, which is complex in this case. I should note that one of the key things we need to do here is, is set up all work on this site so that we are not reliant on adjoining development. So we've consciously gone through this exercise in isolation of DREAMS work uh, to the east of us or other works uh, in, in the proximity of the site. So this is a standalone uh, system. Uh, that can be modified and will be modified over time. Next. Uh, we've taken transit into account in this development, so there is a transit design process that's underway separately uh, by waterfront. Um, so we are taking those considerations in place and looking at how we accommodate uh, those future installations with this work. It is not included at this time. Um, this is a graphic that does show uh, the uh, servicing uh, below grade uh, and indicates the way that we're moving uh, to keep it self-contained on the site and avoid uh, the silo site to the east. Next. So we've gone through, uh, looked at what the design cost would be, uh, what we would require from a construction manager by way of schedule and constructability issues, uh, other consulting input that would be required, plus our internal staff costs, uh, to get this to the point where it is required uh, for that 60% review, and the total is $14.2 million. So our request today again is for the $14.2 million approval. Um, we would uh, do this to uh, uh, move forward with the program. Ultimately, the funding for this would come out of land sale of Keyside. Uh, that we would use uh, current uh, money in our accounts to cover these costs. So we ask for this approval and uh, uh, the above design scope is included in the rolling five year plan. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, project risks, these are normal risks uh, that we would deal with uh, this type of program of potential delays uh, and we've got mechanisms to mitigate any of these these uh, typical issues that we come across. So I'm not going to dwell on this. And the overall schedule, we looked at how uh, we would plan out the delivery of Keysight as an overall program and then looked at the infrastructure elements tied to it. And this is reflected in this very high level schedule that was worked through in due diligence completed in coming up with the budgets for this program and timeline for this program. It will be refined somewhat through the implementation of Keyside, but this is an overview with work anticipated to be done generally in mid-2026 that we may defer certain works uh, so that uh, finishes, for example, are not damaged by uh, the developer who will be ultimately delivering Keyside. From a procurement standpoint, we'll be using our BAFO RFP process for the design team. As for the construction manager, uh, for the new board members, this is BAFO is a best and final offer uh, process wherein we go for a request for qualifications first, and then with pre-qualified firms go for final uh, pricing uh, and scope approval. It's worked very successfully and is the process we've used on the PLFP project.
So I think I've summarized this twice already, um, so I won't repeat it. Um, and here's the motion. Great. Um, any questions of Julius? Great to see uh, this work is going to get underway. And uh, so can I ask um, Jack again and, and uh, Kevin to move uh, in second? Yes, I will. OK, Seconded, great. Chief. OK, thanks. Any discussion? All in favor? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and um, the last matter, I believe, before we will go into the closed session, uh, Pina, uh, you're up to bat on a discussion of um, an amendment to our rolling five year strategic plan. Thank you and good morning and welcome to our three new board members. Um, I'm actually going to take the presentation as read and we'll provide the board with a brief summary. Um, if we could go to slide 246, Charmaine. As per the corporation's delegation of authority, projects less than $5 million in value are approved through our rolling five year strategic plan. As uh, recommended by the Farm Committee at its May 27th meeting, today we are seeking the board's approval of an in-year amendment to the Waterfront Toronto rolling five-year strategic plan for 2021-2022 to add the Parliament Slip Activation Project 60% design at a value of $4.7 million. Once completed, the 60% design would form the basis of a capital approval at the 60% stage gate uh, for the remainder of the design and construction. So we'll be back to the board at that time. Next slide. As you are aware, uh, in March of 2021, Waterfront Toronto announced a proposal to transform Parliament Slip into a world-class destination with exciting activation opportunities in April. Uh, Waterfront Toronto submitted a funding request to the provincial and federal governments, which included a comprehensive feasibility study and business case for the project. This request is currently under review. Next slide. While not part of the uh, current rolling five-year strategic plan, the project is seen as a critical element to activating the waterfront and our exciting vision for the Quayside precinct. And given the adjacency to Keyside, completing this in parallel to the work that Julius just walked through will enable efficiencies and cost savings. Next slide. To summarize the program for Parliament Slip, and um, the project will include a few different components. Uh, number one is two harbor swimming pools with a facilities building with bathrooms and showers and all of the amenities you need for swimming pools. Number two, uh, is a large wooden amphitheater for uh, for viewing performances, fireworks, or activities uh, within the slip, and a canoe and kayak launch with opportunities for kayak rental and on-site storage. A new floating dock, which is shown as number four, um, with concessions and a large full-service floating restaurant at the tip of the dock, and a fixed transportation pier, which is number three in the drawing. Uh, which will provide an opportunity to meet some of the objectives of the marine use strategy, including a potential future water shuttle and water taxi uh, mooring. Uh, if we could skip to slide 256, and I'll just give a quick summary of what's being asked for uh, from the board. As I mentioned, this has already been presented to FARM, uh, and what they are recommending that we request the board's approval for to add Parliament Slip to the five year strategic plan to complete the 60% design for the work I just walked through. If approved, staff will not proceed beyond the 30% design milestone until such time that full funding for the project has been confirmed. Um, the costs that we're requesting, a total of 4.7 million, include all of the design the um, additional studies that are required for the area and all of Waterfront Toronto's uh, internal costs. If there, are, we can maybe put the motion up on the screen and um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, Pete, I just had one question. Um, you know, we do live in a 12 month climate or George. Um, at one point we were looking at whether uh, it would be possible to have um, one of the pools or into a skating rink or something in the winter. It, and I don't see that on the budget. So the um, 
The next phase of design will include studying three different winter, uh, well, well, has many winter alternatives that we cannot come up with, but at this point we've identified three different potential winter activation opportunities. One is the skating rink. One is to keep the pool open year round and heat the pool using waste heat, uh, working wow. with utilities. And then the third is to investigate the installation of a bubble um, over top of the pool that will allow it to stay uh, four season use. Wow, that's great. I didn't realize about the pool being open. That's that's amazing. It's um, a, there's a precedence for it in Helsinki. They do wow. keep a pool, the Alas swimming pools, open to 28 degrees Celsius, the water, using waste heat. Great. Um, uh, Steve, could I ask one question, if you don't sure. mind? Sure. Uh, and Tina, thanks for the presentation. It's, it's Joe. Just a question. I'm fully supportive of where we're heading and will support the motion. Um, the this is to get us to 30 percent. I see. And, you know, that's moving beyond that's contingent on the full funding being met. What's the status of our requests into um, our partners uh, at the at, uh, and I assume that's at the provincial and federal level? Have we formally submitted a request? Is it under review? I'm just curious what the status is. Um, yes, we have formally submitted a full business case to, um, to uh, we actually submitted to all three levels of government, but the ask is to the two, to the provincial and federal governments. I don't, George, do you want to ask, add anything yeah. in terms of status? Yeah, yeah you know what, uh, Joe, what I tell you is in talking to the province, um, they're seeking to try to get this in front of Treasury Board for an approval. Um, and with the feds, they're reviewing it. I haven't heard much from the Fed, feds in terms of status other than they're reviewing it at this point in time. The, the hope is uh, that shortly after, hopefully the province approves it, uh, we will get a, a signal from the feds as well. Okay, and, and I would just say, just as a comment, I mean, because it's such an exceptional project, um, moving forward with the design helps to improve, I think, the desire and the impetus for, for yeah. our partners to come forward because they will see it. Um, yeah. So, no, thank you for that, Tina and George. Actually, um, on that point, uh, Joe, it's a question I was going to raise potentially in camera, but I don't think it matters. But um, there is also a complex discussion um, of our arrangement with the City of Toronto. And is that uh, in terms of the funding uh, of the slip? It, and is that under under control and underway? Uh, with the city, it's mostly around other funding for the Keyside project. Um, and what we are looking at with the city is making sure that they're clear and we're clear what the operating costs would be. Um, so that work is underway with the city because uh, ultimately, if it's transferred to the city, they want to make sure that it's reasonable operating costs. Right. OK, because I know that was an issue. Yeah. OK, um, any other questions? And um, OK, great. Could we have a, a mover and a seconder? Um, Jack again and um, and Joe, how's that? Fine with me. Thank you. Fine with me. OK, great. All in favor? Carrie. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that was a lot. Uh, great job, Pina. Thank you for that. Um, so now I'm going to ask for a motion to go into um, closed session. Kevin? And Jack, I will make that motion. Thanks. Second it. Yep. OK, great. Uh, so we're now back in open session and I would like to have a motion uh, to approve the March 25th board meeting closed session minutes. Uh, so again, Jack and I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to move it, Steve. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, all in favor. Thank you. And a motion to approve the compensation arrangements for the CEO of the corporation as described to the board in the meeting. Is there a mover and seconder for that? Wendy and uh, Jack again? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Carrie. So, um, once again, uh, everybody, I want to uh, thank you again for the time you've taken this morning. Uh, we obviously did a lot of work this morning and uh, covered a lot. Um, normally, I would say to everybody, uh, have a great summer uh, because usually we don't sit in July and August, but this year is an exception and we will be calling both an IREC and a board meeting in July, as you're aware. Um, and so I appreciate your indulgence on that. 
I look forward as well to uh, working with the new board members once again and hopefully have you uh, have an appropriate orientation and I hope to set up um, individual meetings with you uh, over the next uh, month or so. Um, and uh, hoping that uh, after July and September, maybe, maybe, maybe we might even have an in-person meeting in the fall. So we'll keep my fingers crossed for that. Um, and uh, that's it. So um, I need a motion to terminate the meeting. So moved. Okay, Jack and uh, Kevin. I will second that. Very efficient. Okay. okay, thank you everyone. Have a great day.